Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Mary Research Institute. Um, I would like to thank you for your attendance in this today's seminar. Um, my name is Nila Warda. I am researcher at Smeru Research Institute, and it's my honor to moderate this uh, discussion. Why uh, we have Professor Hal Hill here, and um, he is the professor in the Australian National University ANU, and I can see here some of his students. Yeah, well, actually, I'm the alumni of ANU as well, but we went to different schools, so. Um, unfortunately, I never attend um, his lectures, uh, so I'm so sorry, but you never have a chance to have me as your student. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, um, actually the unfortunate is on me, but that's okay. Today is going to be paid off because um, all we are here is so lucky to uh, listen his lectures lively. So um, grab this opportunity wisely and involve as much as you can. And to facilitate your participation, we have arranged two different channels. Uh, the first one is the traditional Q and A uh, Q and A session um, right after the presentation. And um, if you cannot hold your questions during the presentation, we already arranged the arranged the slideo for you. Never heard about it? It's like the um, audience um, interaction platform where you can post your questions and comments during the presentation. Yeah, and it's super duper easy. But uh, before going for more details about how Slido works, and I think I'd like to inform you briefly about the emergency evacuation procedure in this building. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's considered as emergency as well. I <laughs> think. So, on hearing an evacuation alarm or an instruction of emergency. Immediately keys all activities and secure your personal valuables and act in accordance with directions given by the emergency control personnel and evacuate this building immediately. And in a fire, do not, do not use a lift to evacuate a building and for instead, locate the, um, locate the nearest exit, which is in the corner. Yes. And there's going to be the emergency light. Light. <laughs> okay, so yeah. <laughs> so um, I think move calmly to the nominated evacuation assembly area, which is the, uh, the parking area in front of the building, and do not leave the area until the all clear instruction has been given. Okay. And the other important things to notice are that the restroom is at that side. Yes. And that side in the corner, and then we also provide the refreshment at your back at your in the uh, back of the room and please help yourself and do not forget to grab our latest publication on the display table and the most important one that you can access the material of this seminar on www.smero.org.id slash um, yeah in uh, www.smero.org.id slash seminar 7 august 2018 uh, but actually afterward we're going to uh, send this presentation if you put your email address and then uh, what else okay so about the slide of things let's have a short trial so uh, this one oh, sorry uh, the hill the hashtag hill seminar is the have a trial one like a short trial make sure you uh, all of you can uh, use it. So open your browser and go to the www.slido.com and then you can enter the hashtag trial, trial seminar. And there, uh, so you have two options to join this Slido. The first one is you can put your questions or comments, but the other one is you can uh, read through the available questions and you can uh, press the like button. So the questions or comment with the most like will come uh, up front, so we can uh, read uh, the questions with yeah everyone's interested. Thank you. 
Maybe we can go to the later slide, Tony. Sorry. Just to make sure that you know how it works, like this. So you can register your name, your initial, or whatever, or you just leave it anonymous. And we can do this. Hello, Tess. And maybe Marathi would help me to, like, put some things at home. Bruce Wayne, okay. And you can just press the icon like here if you find some of questions or comments are interesting, or it represents your ideas as well, or you agree with it, just put like. So you uh, not only can post the question, but you can also like it. So, uh, no, you have don't have, <laughs> you don't have options. So then uh, the one that have the most like will come up front. So for trial, just for trial, I invite you to express your idea, which is actually still relevant with uh, relevant with our topics. I would like to uh, know your ideas about the well-known terms, which is um, everywhere. That is penak zaman kuto. Okay, this is still relevant with our topic today. So I'd like to know your ideas about it and put it. And you can. Uh, whether you say you agree with it or just give your reasons or whatever about uh, the term penak jaman kuto. Okay. Yeah, so it's actually uh, for you not know about it. It's like the term that I don't know with the uh, Suharto figure and then say like it's penak jaman kuto. I think most of you are familiar with it. Penak, okay. Come on, please. Give your opinions or stability, consistency, good. I just fell for only one year. Interesting. Or of an order to do it. <laughs> it means, uh, no, it's not good. Biasa aja. One strong commander. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, no one, so I think they don't want to put their name. It's not true. <laughs> okay. Is this so imaginary? Okay. Okay. I think testimony from the one got super smart scholarship. Okay, good for you. Okay, I think all of you know how it works. And yeah, there is some likes. And but Latri, would you help me to put some comments on top? Okay. Okay, yeah, the lot will be stable. Well, yeah, I think the one that's going in the top of questions, then uh, I'll <laughs> ask for uh, how he later to in the yeah. Okay, so uh, that's how Slido works. Uh, you can post your comment and the questions during the presentation, and we're going to discuss some of your comments after the presentation. And don't forget that you can also like. Uh, your others, um, the others comment or um, questions. And oh no, uh, enter the other hashtag which is Hill Seminar, H I L L Seminar. Yes, that's the true one. So if you don't know how it works, uh, switch the event. Uh, this one, Hill Seminar. Do you know how it works? Yeah, Hill Seminar. That's the better one. Yes. Uh, switch event. There's an icon switch event. Okay, that's it. Okay, so let's move to the um, 
let's move to the main session. I think in today's seminar, Professor Hal Hill more or less is indicating about the answer or your will confirm your ideas about the Hegemon. Because um, Pak Hal Hill will present one of his ultimate work entitled Half a Century of Indonesia Economic Development, Trends and um, uh, Conjectures and Questions. And from this presentation, uh, we'll figure out the big, picture, the big picture of how the Indonesia economic develops from 1960 from 1960 to 2010. So I think uh, Suharto Ira is in the middle of it. And um, the big picture of the Indonesia economic development is in terms of the economic growth and each part of it. It's like the saving and investment, trade, the government spending, consumption, and of course the economic outcome like living standard, uh, poverty and inequality, and something between the growth and the outcome, which is uh, like policies, institutions, and the major events during the 50 years. Um, yes, of course, it's absolutely a big work, but no wonder. Uh, Hal Hill is a professor emeritus of Southeast Asian Economies in Australian National University. Yes, in particular at the Arn Corn Department of Economics, Crawford School, College of Asia, and the Pacific. And his main research interest is the economic development of Southeast Asia, in which he has been writing about 160 journal articles and book chapters, that's a lot. And on top of being the author or editor of 18 books, he also serves on the editorial board of 13 academic journals. And he is also an occasional op-ed contributor to Australian and Asian newspaper and magazine. And uh, given, given his extensive knowledge on Asian economics, uh, he has worked as a consultant for the Australian government, the Indonesian government, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and several un United Nations agencies. So, ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, so ensure your seat belt is firmly seated. <laughs> Let's welcome Professor Halil. Oh, sorry, Rasama Deng and Papa Taekian Wee. Yeah, so very nice to see you, Pat. Uh, looking so well, and your son as well. And Kawan Kawan Line, so a lot of familiar faces here. So I see Daniel somewhere. Daniel, hi, Daniel. And Wawan. And Elan, is some, Elan, hi, Elan. Uh, Dan Ransin, a friend of mine, Dari Kabuda in Australia. Um, Tugasnya adalah supaya budget alokasi untuk semeru tahun depan akan dua kali naik, right? So this guy, this guy is important. <laughs> and kawan, kawan line. Who else am I? Am I? I'm sure there are other people. But anyway, to everybody, hello. Yeah, uh, it's it's a great pleasure to be here. So pertama kali, I'm going to I'm going to embarrass I'm going to embarrass our set and staff line. Then bicara sedikit tentang semeru. Yeah. So, saya, uh, saya beranggota Smeru fan club. I love, I love Smeru, yeah? Uh, uh, walaupun Smeru masih, masih agak, uh, belum begitu tua seperti saya, umurnya di bawah 20 tahun, tetapi sudah bikin reputasi uh, sebagai salah satu lembaga penelitian sosial, salah satu yang terbaik di dunia, yeah? Uh, Smeru memang saya kira, saya kira bagus. Then, da, dalam era, dalam era fake news, yeah, fake news, dan era 
populism dan lain-lain, uh, Indonesia dan kawan-kawan Indonesia memang sangat perlu uh, lembaga penelitian seperti SMIR, ya? uh, karena biasanya saya seorang optimis bahwa eventually the power of ideas, yeah, good ideas eventually win, yeah? the power of ideas win, uh, not always of course, <laughs> sering kali, then dalam rangka itu tidak ada lembaga penelitian yang lebih penting untuk Indonesia daripada SMERU because SMERU gives the basis for evidence-based policy making which I guess as economists we all we all believe in. Uh, so uh, I want to say a ingin mengucapkan terima kasih banyak kepada para semua staff SMERU, uh, SMERU, sama especially pendiri pendiri SMERU termasuk Budiau, uh, sama Pakana, kawan kawan lain there, and it's a wonderful opportunity. To, to come to Smeru, um, although well, I'm sort of Berber Upper Town, so Sajak Say Kasini, I always feel as though I'm sort of part of Smeru, Mukim Kanasin Kekmudin and Piliao, Di Mana Saja, so I feel as though I'm part of Smeru and I admire Smeru very much. So, Terima Kasih Banyak Atas Kesempatan. Then, Kalau Mau Langsung Ke Emergency Sekarang Silakan. Okay, so, Tentang um, Presentasi Saya, Tentang presentasi saya, itu saya sedang oleh kerana saya sekarang pensiun, berarti harus kerja lebih keras nak digaji. Ini ini definisi Americans ya. Kerja lebih keras, right, Lali? Where you Americans do that, yeah? Harus kerja lebih keras nak digaji, right? So dalam rangka itu, dan oleh kerana Canberra itu kampung kecil, tidak ada banyak. Banyak, oh, harus pakai ini. Sorry. And oleh kerana Canberra itu kampung kecil, tidak ada banyak gangguan selain dari banyak kangaroo. Oleh kerana tidak ada banyak, banyak gangguan, saya sedang ada projek, ada projek untuk uh, untuk menulis um, edisi baru buku ini. Uh, buku ini sudah bahan sejarah. Ya? Sudah bahan sejarah tulis uh, sekitar 20 tahun lalu tentang ekonomi Indonesia, dan saya sedang berusaha bikin edisi baru, ya, buku ini, uh, walaupun mungkin, <laughs> mungkin tidak akan selesai, tapi saya akan coba. Dan dalam rangka itu, uh, untuk presentasi saya hari ini, saya mau uh, kasih sedikit gambaran, uh, sort of big picture, tentang, tentang rencana saya, uh, edisi, edisi ketiga buku ini. So dalam rangka itu, memang saya perlu bantuan, saya perlu bantuan dari kawan-kawan, dan oleh sebab itu saya datang ke kantor Smeru untuk dapat nasihat dan bantuan. Ya. So dalam rangka itu, uh, half a century of Indonesian economic development trends, conjectures, questions. So fokusnya hari ini, uh, saya mau fokusnya tentang conjectures, ya, dan, dan questions. So, the trends memang agak membosankan. Kita semua tahu, ya. Hi. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see you before, sorry. Um, so, uh, it's, um, yeah, I want to focus mainly on conjectures and trends, uh, and, and questions, dari pada trends, because the trends, we all know the trends, and Hario always tells me what the trend is. So, trend I can't, we all know, but the conjectures and the questions I'm not sure about. So, I really want to get your advice, please, on, on that. Uh, okay, so, and I guess, um, I don't know, Tintang Chara Sinema Jusini, Silakan Mengganggu, Silakan Tanya Langsung. Is that okay, this um, Ibu Moderator? Bagaimana? No, no questions. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay, sure. Fine. Okay, so, Tapi Silakan, Kalau Tidak Setuju, Dengan Saya Silakan Bicara Langsung. Okay, so where do I put this here? So, uh, Yang Pertama, how do you characterize Indonesian economic development? Uh, Mafia, say, pakai campuran bahasa, yeah? Bahasa kangaroo dan, ba dan bahasa garuda. <laughs> how to character, people have struggled with how to characterize Indonesian economic development. Salama lebi dari lima puluh tahun, yeah? So in his in his bagay chonto chonto saja, some of the observations on um, Indonesia 
Bole de Cada Cabana Can Ole Orang Bule. Yeah, maybe the Bule have really struggled more than the <laughs> than Orang Indonesia have struggled. So Chonto Sajja, Benjamin Higgins, that famous quote, yeah? Indonesia chronic economic dropout. And Inga Bawa Ben Higgins Tingal di Sini Lama, yes, yeah? Salama Berberapa Town, Parawaktu Town, Semilambas Lima Puluan, Parawaktu Dia, Benazia Bapa Sumitro uh, Dulu. Uh, Guna Modal, Asian drama, a uh, literal prospect of rapid economic development. Tatapi, uh, Berberapa Town Lagi, Manuat World Bank, Indonesian economic miracle. Uh, Anne Booth, young colleague Sayalama, the ANU, a history of missed opportunities. That was the subtitle of her book. Uh, Showcase State, any Rex Mortimer, he's sort of what we call the Golongan, politically Golongan Kiri, yeah? He's sort of Showcase State. From Monash, uh, Improbable Nation, uh, Pasani, and this catchy title, yeah, from one of your uh, colleagues, pa Rizal Rumley, Indonesia from Showcase to Basket Case. So, uh, trying to capture the, the Indonesian story, you can see people are struggling with how to, how to characterize Indonesian economic development, yeah? So, uh, but I think two general, um, what am, yeah, before I begin the kind of presentation, two things are real. Two facts are really important. So this is facts, not fake news. Huh? Facts. First fact is any Dadi World Bank Growth Commission. Asai Sering Pake slide in The World Bank tried to estimate how many countries have achieved rapid economic growth. Salama Saratus Town to Ahir. Definisi rapid growth adalah laju pertumbuhan GDP tujuh uh, percent. Uh, ke atas selama minimum sepuluh tahun. So, kesimpulan mereka adalah dari seratus lima puluh negara atau sebetulnya ekonomi, karena Hong Kong, Taiwan ekonomi, uh, kurang dari sepuluh persen jumlah negara itu uh, masuk club uh, high growth. And itu termasuk Indonesia. Yeah? Indonesia salah satu negara in the, uh, the club istimewa. Club is the mayway, yeah, to ding and laju betumbu and yang tinki. So that's the first point. At, um, I'm thinking, say, fikir tentang konteks, yeah. That's the first point I want to emphasize. Nanti mungkin saya akan bicara tentang tantangan dan masalah, tapi jangan lupa ini, yeah, the, the high growth rate. In fact, yang kedua adalah, uh, well upon Indonesia, Barangota, Kawasan, Asia, Timur, yang maju cepat sekali, Ada perbezaan antara Asia Timur Utara dan Asia Timur Selatan. Yaitu Asia Timur dan Singapore boleh dikata analytically masuk club Asia Timur Utara. Kind of it's newly industrialising economy. So, um, well upon Indonesia masuk club yang istimewa, it's, uh, it's at the lower end of the club. Masih di club normal satu, but at the lower end. So, these two facts kind of tell me the sort of story, the narrative I'm going to present uh, to you today and to get your comments. Uh, okay, so this is the content. So I won't, this is, Kira Kira, this is the contents uh, of, of my, the book. So Sitya topic, Kira Kira Satu Bab. So I haven't got time to talk about every, every bit, but this is just to give you the picture. And uh, I want to mainly focus on knowledge gaps and areas of contention conjectures. So that's I'm looking for tr ideas from you, please, on suggestions, how to think about some of the big issues where I'm not sure. Okay, setting the scene. So that's, that's uh, it, I think, the more I think about economics, the more I think history matters. And so uh, um, the history obviously is very relevant. So these are just some quotes, the impact of Dutch colonialism from that wonderful book, Why Nations Fail. That's the Mogley Robinson. Actually, the quote is based on the work of my ANU colleague, uh, Anthony Reid, a historian at ANU. Um, uh, the Sultan's quote in 1966. Um, also, the work of Pierre van der Ring, my ANU colleague, uh, that Indonesian per capita income in 1965 was similar or probably lower than what it was 50 years earlier. So, uh, uh, Setinga uh, Abad Tida Kamajuan economy. So that's that's a kind of important historical fact. Uh, also, uh, my my guru Dari Dulu Heinzant, uh, his observation about 
Indonesia in 1966, a, a country literally bankrupt, a decade of ever-increasing economic mismanagement. Uh, and as we know, around the 1960s, uh, if you think of about 1960 as being kind of initial conditions, of course, initial conditions, Sabatunya, Lebi, Lebi, Jao Lebi Dulu, Tabi, just when, when the database became better, we could measure these indicators. Initial conditions showed Indonesia was, even compared to its neighbors, was really lagging. So, Chonto Saja, um, Chonto Saja, is that? No. Um, how do I? No, I just want to use the lampu. <laughs> it doesn't matter. But Chonto Saja, Chonto Saja Ini. So this is, you know, the well-known, um, the well-known Barrow Lee years of schooling. So this just tells, just a reminder of how far Indonesia was lagging its neighbours in, in 1960. Uh, life expectancy, infant mortality. So Indonesia initial conditions were very unfavourable. That's that's just the obvious point to make. <coughs> okay, um, so this is where I want. This is the first slide where I want your advice, uh, Pat Lally. I want your advice, please, Mo Mohan Mohan Bantuan. Uh, so legacies of history. So if you're trying to understand current Indonesian economic conditions, what historical factors are relevant? In, in shaping the way Indonesian economy and Indonesian policy making processes uh, uh, are developed. So, first one I think, so this is what I'm trying to think about to try and as the context, or if you'd like, the analytical prism to look at um, Indonesian economic development and policy. So, first one is inflation aversion, and that's of, co of course because Pengaman Dari Town and Ampulu are in hyperinflation. And so I guess that's a traumatic experience. So that means for macroeconomics, macroeconomic policy, I think inflation aversion is important. Second one is concern about preservation of territorial integrity. So most countries don't really worry much about the national boundaries because it's just, you know, Suda Lama Begitu, yeah? So in Australia, we never really worry about, you know, will Sbagian Barat Will it, will it secede or something? It doesn't really matter. But, of course, for Indonesia it does matter because your international boundaries have changed and, you know, Papua, Masuk, uh, Republic, uh, Setla, uh, Berberapatan, after Setla, Kumadeka. And so that's another point, I think, which is a kind of um, a conditioning factor from history. Uh, a third factor is, I, I, I'm arguing, maybe mungkin it's contentious, uh, there's a general scepticism towards liberalism. So this is what I, I say, Balajadari, Mentor, Sayadulu, Tekian, We Amahum, Kian, We Salalu Bilan, Jangan Lupa, yeah? This sort of scepticism about the liberal economic model is quite important. And in some ways, I like this quote from, from my friend uh, Dede. Uh, in one of the Indonesia Update volumes. He said, Indonesia was born a free trader because of its geography. Uh, yet it is consistently reluctant to accept globalization. So this is another one of these sort of historical legacies, I think. Uh, one, two, three. Fourth one is challenge of catching up. So this is, I guess, the legacy of the Zaman Colonial. Um, if, if Kalasai Tidak Sala Jumla Orang Indonesia Yang Tamat Dari Universitas Pada Waktu Mulai Merdeka Adalah Dua Ribu Orang. So clearly the legacy of history, the catch-up, is a big issue. Uh, next is ethnic segmentation. I think it, it's clearly looking at Indonesian history over the long run, the challenge of ethnic diversity and ethnic segmentation clearly affects a lot of economic policy and thinking, uh, especially the issue of, in a sense, of pribumi, non-pribumi, um, a bit like Malaysia, but of course Indonesia is also very different from Malaysia in that respect. Uh, and the final one is uh, the legacy of history, the destruction of property rights. So this is one of the arguments of that Asamoglu Robinson, in a sense, the colonial impacts involving the destruction of property rights and therefore running a modern commercial economy with pure property rights is always going to be a, a big issue. So that's the first one um, I need comments on, please, Mohan Bantuan. Have I got this right, Kira Kira, or am I missing something, yeah? Do we say Tanya Sakarang Pa Asipata Nati Saja? Let me back to Ruth. Shall I keep going?
Okay, terima kasih. Okay, uh, and a bit more. Yeah, one more. This I like this one. So somehow there's been um, there's been a, a, f a feature of Indonesian economic policy has been pragmatism. Mungkin karena pengaruh faktor faktor dulu, pragmatism has been an important factor. So I like these two quotes. Yeah, from two of the founding fathers of Indonesian economics profession, uh, Pat Sudley and Pat Sumitro. Pat Sudley, when he was head of the, the investment board, the young Baran Sebelum Beka BM was called something else. He said, we, when we started out attracting PMR, uh, <laughs> we didn't dare refuse. We didn't even ask for credentials, yeah? Pragmatic. <laughs> and Pat Mitro, when he was Parawatu di Amentri Kuwangan Town Limapuluan, he says, I was a strong protagonist of foreign exchange controls. Then I saw what happened under Sukarno. I know how easy it is to smuggle the goods. I know those who are close to the sources of power will get their hands on the foreign exchange. So I think this has been a feature of Indonesian economic policy making as well, This the, the influence of pragmatism in a sense. And I think that's why one of the reasons why Indonesia has been an effective economic crisis manager uh, where sometimes it has struggled to achieve the really high growth rates of some of its neighbours. So that's another one of my questions for you. Okay, uh, so long-term growth record. So this is this is clearly this is a well-known story. Um, a lot of this comes from actually my work with uh, Hario. Uh, thank you, Hario, for for your help with this. So immediately, one big question comes out of those uh, Anka Anka Ini. So this is just the um, sorry, this is just the the growth story. Um, by the way, untuk ini, uh, untuk, untuk tabel dan gambaran ini, saya dapat bantuan dari salah satu mahasiswa S3 DANU. Some of you know him, Chandra Triputra. So if you're watching this, Chandra Trimakasi Vanyak. Um, so that he helped me with the figures and tables. So uh, immediately when you look at this figure, you see one big question. Well, you see two big questions. Mengapa? Well, first of all, you see this notion of path dependence memang salah. You know, there's an argument that in the development economics literature that countries are prisoners of their history. Clearly, Indonesia, in some ways, every country is a prisoner of history, but Indonesia is not a prisoner in the sense that Salama Lima Pulutan Tida Kamajuan economy, Tourist Tiba Tiba Salama Tiga Pulutan economy Maju Chapat Sakali. So that's the first point. Path dependence is refuted. You know, there is this development literature saying some countries are never going to develop. So, Jalas Dalam Castles, Indonesia, Itu, Itu Salah. Uh, uh, Yang Kedua, uh, Adala Kemajuan Economy, Order Baru, then uh, Kemajuan Economy, Era Democracy, Perbedan Chukul Besar, yeah? Yaitu Sakita Dua, uh, two percentage points faster Zaman Dulu. So uh, I'm not here as a defender of Bapa Suharto, just observing facts, yeah? Uh, and then questions come, why is it different? So that's, that's GDP growth. Brati, Kalau per capita GDP growth, the difference is pretty big, yeah? It's from a bit over 5% per capita to um, about 3% per capita. So Boi de Kata, um, economic growth per capita, hampir dua kali lebih tinggi pada waktu dulu. So, what's the reason for that? Uh, why is it? Why has growth been slower? Is it partly the the prolonged effects of the Krismon, ninety seven, ninety eight? Maybe initially that would be the effect, but it, it's unlikely to be the story for the current period. So, what else is explaining it? So that's that's another question where I want your advice, please. Uh, some of this, some of the growth, some people argue, like Paul Krugman says, it's a myth. That is because it's um, there's no total factor productivity growth, but uh, clearly that's wrong. Uh, again, as Hario has shown, Salasatu Korban Sayajuga from his PhD dissertation, Mizania, that TFP growth in Indonesia has been positive. Has it been achieved just by running down the stock of natural capital? Yea, to green growth, Kachil Sakali. Well. It seems to be, or well, that's part of the story, it's not the main part of the story. Okay, so that's the sort of growth story. Uh, savings and investment, not much, there's not much uh, to talk about. 
so it's a story of growth leading to rising savings, rising investment. Indonesia was a really low investment savings country in the uh, before 1970s, and that's what you expect when you get low economic growth. And then savings and investment rose very quickly. The one um, puzzle on this big picture, long term, is um, why Indonesia switched from a current account deficit to a current account surplus from Suharto era to democracy era. So we know that a current account deficit and surplus is, is another way of saying it's the difference between investment and savings. That is, Indonesia was drawing on foreign savings most of the time during uh, Suharto era, that is, running current account deficits. Whereas uh, after, the, after that period, um, Indonesia was running a current account surplus for a lot of the time. Not now, but for quite a lot of the time earlier. That's another question. What's changed um, in the Indonesian economy and the global economy to make that happen? Uh, so international comparison. Whenever economists talk about growth rates, it's always got to be debanding can upper. What's, what's the comparator? So uh, when I first came to Indonesia, um, as Pat Lali can tell us, the comparator for Indonesia was Nigeria, Bukan, because in 1970, per capita income, Nigeria, Indonesia, kira kira sama. So between Nigeria, lebi tinggi, jumlah pendidikan Nigeria lebi maju. But similar economies, big tropical economies exporting uh, oil. So that comparison is no longer relevant. Uh, it's per capita, pendapatan per capita, Indonesia, Nigeria. Uh, so what's the comparator? Well, there's no obvious comparator. Um, um, in a way, Indonesia is, is unique. Well, of course, we know that it's unique, but there's no obvious comparator, uh, unless Pat Lali tells me there is an obvious comparator. But uh, Philippines, maybe, because it's got some similarities, you know, Negara Kapulo and crisis and democracy, but it's different also, very different history and different natural resource base. Um, and uh, India, yeah, some comparisons, but also very different. Anyway, this, this is a sort of the, the story for uh, the comparative growth story. So the main story really is what, which is, that, um, is this story. And it, it's a bit like the, um, it's a bit like the Asian games, yeah, to China, Menang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, but the sort of comparative story is pretty clear. Um, Indonesia's done very well. Uh, remember, jangan lupa, ya bapa pendapat per capita Indonesia lebih tinggi dari pada China sampai sekitar pertengahan tahun sembilan puluhan. So remember, Indonesia, because Indonesia, remember, the big turning points in Asian economic history were Indonesia 1966 and China 1978. So China opened up about 12 years later than Indonesia. And India opened up about 1991, so 25 years later. So Indonesia began to progress more quickly than the, the other Asian giants, especially India and China, because it opened up earlier. Uh, so record of crisis management, if you think about, you remember the, the famous economic historian Angus Madison used to remi tell us, remind us, that you've got to think of growth, long-term growth, and you've got to think of the interruptions to long-term growth. And the, the interruptions to long-term growth normally happen for two reasons. One is an economic crisis, and secondly, conflict. And so crises really matter because crises can set countries back for a long time. Just by Ankan, Kalau Indonesia Tida to Chris Montan, Similan Blas, Similan Tujus, Similan Indonesia now would be a much richer country if it didn't have the crisis. Uh, Toronto, Saja, Philippines. Philippines, Salama Dua Pulu Town, Tidat Maju. All that kind of crisis young Dalam, Tada Town, Dalapan Pulu. So crises matter. Therefore, you have to think about Indonesian story in the context of crisis management. And this is where I think Indonesia has been a, a big success story. If you think of the last 50 years, it's had four crises, four economic crises, putting aside the politics, four economic crises, and three of them it's managed pretty effectively. Mid-60s, mid which Barasal Dari Dalam Negri was a homegrown crisis. The mid-80s, when Indonesia was one of the few energy exporting countries um, to adjust to the sudden drop in global energy prices, demanding Kan Negara line, again, Sabudi Nigeria, then line line. 
because of effective reform, this was Zaman, I guess, Papa Ali Wadana, Almahom, the key reformer at the time, along with the. 97 98 was the one major crisis, which I'll discuss a bit later. And then a uh, global financial crisis, Kira Kira Indonesia Tida Ada Masala. So four crisis episodes, three of them quickly managed, one of them became serious. So that when you're thinking of long-term growth story, you have to think of crisis management as well as the, as well as the, the growth. Okay, so that's, sort of, that's another part of the story, and that's just the crisis story. This is a, a paper I did with, with Dede, with Bas, uh, Hathi Basri, on the, comparing the two crises, 97, 98, and 2008, 9. So just Indonesia managed the second one effectively. Okay, so uh, continuing on, just this is a topic, so I'm just going through them quite quickly, yeah, to give you a kind of gambaran bazaar. So structural change, it's, again, this is a lot of the work I've done with, with uh, Hario. Uh, on structural change, the sort of conventional story, um, not really much to say for most of the time. That is, um, the, 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 main structure, oops, the main structural change is, um, as in all countries which, which are dynamic, uh, agriculture declines, industry rises, services rise. That's sort of what you expect, um, so nothing surprising. Uh, the one surprise is the sectoral drivers of growth are different. In the democratic era, Diban Inkan uh, Zaman Suharto. And the obvious difference is um, the obvious difference is uh, the the driver of growth shifted from the tradable sector to the non tradable sector, especially from manufacturing to services. Uh, and that's again something which uh, Hario and I have worked on quite a bit, trying to understand this question of slow industrial growth. And so I have some discussion of this question. In fact, we have a paper on on that Hario, yeah, on, on Indonesian industrial policy. What what, what was Judul Nyapa Hario, Indonesian industrial policy, sl catching up, slowing down, and and muddling through. Catching up, slowing down, muddling through. That was quite a catchy title, yeah, if, if we may say so. So why is manufacturing slowed down sharply since the Crismon? So there's some discussion. I, I think there are three key factors, partly the, the Dutch disease, but that's not, that's not the only explanation because in the first commodity boom, Indonesian industrialization was still very rapid. Secondly, a general equilibrium story of China's rise, that is lowering the global price of manufacturers. And thirdly, and probably I think most important, the domestic policy regime has switched to favour, implicitly favour non-tradables over tradables. But that also is where I want to get your advice. Am I, am I telling this sort of story correctly? That's a big question. In particular, um, uh, missing out on the way global industrialization, industrial organization has changed, Indonesia missing out on the global production networks. Um, is oh, Mukti, hi, I didn't see you. Hello, how are you? So that's that's the title of Ibu Mukti's Tia Salasatu Korban Saya Juga. <laughs> Good to see you, Mukti. Actually, I think Kameja Ini Juga Dari Mukti. Terima kasih. It's my favorite. Uh, Kameja Badi, thank you. So that was Mukti's dissertation title. Why is Indonesia missing out on global production networks, right? That was it, wasn't it? Yeah. And so part of the story is actually the Mukti story. And also my colleague at ANU, some of you may have seen the Hadi Susastro lecture by my uh, friend and colleague Premachandra Atakola. So it's the Ibu Mukti and the Chandra story, I think. There's a lot of it anyway. Combined with some of the labour market story, for example, that that uh, Asib has written on. So that's that's I think that's part of the story. But that's a, a big topic, uh, which is just I'm just putting it as a question for you to comment on, please. Okay, international dimension. So this is back to this. Um, I see as a central paradox that by and large Indonesia has has benefited from global economic engagement most of the time, except when you've got sudden commodity boom and bust, or when you've got global capital volatility, in general, Indonesia has benefited from global engagement. But back to the, back to the argument of Pat Tekiangwe Dulu, Indonesia's always been pretty skeptical of the benefits of globalization. 
So that's the sort of general story which I want to portray uh, in a sense. And that's a little bit like the book I mentioned before of Anne Booth, not the recent one, but the earlier one, subtitled uh, uh, something like A History of Missed Opportunity. So I think that's also part of the story as well, in a sense, not capturing the benefits of globalization. And in a way, it's back to that Mukti story again, that missing out on the global production networks. Indonesia is still missing out, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> um, in fact, in the book just out, edited by um, Paacho uh, Patede and Ibu Mari Pangestu on whatever the title's called, we've got a paper in it with another one of our Korban, uh, Daisy Pane, on this globalization missing out thing. Okay, so, um, so that's the sort of story. I, I won't go into detail, but it's... It's, it's again rising openness. Uh, this is just the sort of standard measures of openness. Indonesia, sort of like the other countries, not that different. That's the trade shares. And this is the investment story. And this is the, and this is in a sense the most interesting part of the story, which is the rise of manufacturing uh, exports. And this is the story through the 1980s, in a sense. Uh, I think in some ways the, Second most important period of economic policy making in Indonesia. If you think of the mid 60s being perhaps the most important, the second most important arguably was the big reforms of the 1980s, which I don't think have ever been repeated, at least in the way they were done then. And so this is the rise of Indonesia becoming an industri a major industrial exporter for the first time. So that's an important part of the story, I think. Uh, so, and then uh, the other part of the story on international dimensions is how Indonesia has adjusted to external shocks. So you you'd, would hypothesize that you would get a close correlation between trends in the terms of trade, that is the, ra the, pr the ratio of export prices to import prices, and the real exchange rate. And so the dark line, the real exchange rate, is kind of telling you that story. So this is the, this is the, um, oops, this is the, Sorry, um, <laughs> this is the oil boom in the 70s, and this is the oil bust, and this is the exchange rate response. So that's part of the reason why Indonesia, I think, has been a pretty effective uh, macroeconomic manager following the terms of trade. Uh, so, so that's sort of the international, that's the international dimension story, one chapter in, in three minutes, <laughs> but trying to give you a kind of sketch of the story. Um, and, and again, the, the, one of the interesting questions is Indonesia responded very effectively to the commodity boom and bust in the 1980s, but probably less so this time, this, this century. So a, a very nice monograph by uh, Acho Patunru and um, Shamsu Rahaja, Bad Times, Bad Policies. Remember that famous statement by pa Sudley? Good times make bad policies and bad times make good policy. So the conjecture of Pa Acho and Pa Shamsu is maybe that sort of subtly, so-called subtly law doesn't apply anymore. Question mark anyway. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's the sort of, that's the trade story. So uh, the macro story. Um, so I think this is generally an Indonesian success story in the sense that, uh, and I think it relates back to the earlier point I made about inflation aversion, Indonesia since 1967 has basically been a, a country, as I said, where macroeconomic management has been guided by inflation aversion. Once you have something traumatic as hyperinflation, you kind of, it's in the DNA to try and avoid it again. So that's that's the sort of story, and it's reinforced by positive neighbourhood effects. That is, most of Indonesia's neighbours have been effective macroeconomic managers. So, you know, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and so on. So that's the sort of um, that's the story, uh, except for this one big crisis event, which I, I won't talk about because we banyak tulis on tentang krismon, but it's a story of everything going wrong at once. Uh, and in a sense, a perfect storm, a perfect storm in a negative sense of both international factors and domestic factors, both uh, becoming very hostile to Indonesia. Uh, and so domestic policy settings, uh, in a sense, were hadn't adjusted to the new world, Padasadi, to, of global capital market volatility. 
uh, regime change maybe was a factor. And of course, the IMF um, played a negative role during the Christmas. So that sort of story is, that's a separate story, but this is part of it. Huh? And so this is the general um, macro story of generally low inflation, N not always low enough. Um, and that's been one of the challenges for, um, and this is the fiscal story again, fairly moderate, fairly moderate fiscal deficits in the Suharto era because of the balanced budget rule, in the democratic era because of the 2003 fiscal law. So fairly good fiscal policy uh, in aggregate. But, um, but still, so the macro picture is good, uh, to tapi, to tapi, and so these are some of the to tapis. Every country, the city of Nagara at a to tapi, and this is, this is to tapi for Indonesia. The fiscal efforts is, is not that strong, uh, not much progressivity in the tax system, subsidy problems, central government, uh, central local government, and some of the monetary policy issues also, I think, still, still a challenge. But, but big picture is, is I think pretty good compared to what you remember the counterfactual is what it could have been. So the big picture is still not bad. Uh, okay, so that's that's another chapter. So I'm just quickly taking you through some of these chapters and trying to give you a picture of what I the sort of general orientation of what I want to do. So this is um, this is another chapter on subnational development dynamics. Um, key point is Indonesia has stayed together. Um, I, I remember Paratown. Um, Pat Lali would know this better. Pada waktu Krismon ada persepsi bahwa Indonesia akan menjadi Yugoslavia. Uh, akan, what do you call it? Akan. And so it hold, it's holding together. That's obviously a success story. Exactly. That's right, exactly. That's right, exactly. That's a very important point, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. There would be Nagara Jawa, Nagara Sumatra, Nagara Papua, and Nine Nine. Yeah, that's very important. <laughs> that's right. You know. Bagaimana Hario? Yeah. Because of. Oh, the fiscal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's an important point also, Trimikasi Hario. Yeah. So that, this issue, Indonesia holding together. So we had a up to Indonesia update on sorry Indonesia update on um, regional development about three or four years ago, um, including speakers from here like Dino and others. And the key point, which made by a political scientist, some of you may know Marcus Metzner. Marcus said, "Don't just focus on the economy and the social stuff. The key thing is the designers of autonomy daerah. The main objective was to keep the country together." So holding together. Um, so in a way, I'm looking at the economy, but it's the it's the politics which, in some ways, is really more important. Uh, as far as we can tell, it's it's difficult to estimate uh, cr across country, but as far as we can tell, um, interregional inequality has been quite stable in Indonesia since we've been able to measure the the, national, the regional accounts. Remember, beginning in the 1970s, people like Hendra, Hendra Smara used to measure it. And the, the orange line, which is the relevant indicator, is pretty stable. This is some work I've done with another one of my korban, uh, um, uh, Yogi Vidyatama. So it's held together, it's held together uh, partly by the the fact that regional inequality hasn't increased. And so that's the sort of, that's the map of Indonesia, which everybody knows pretty well. Um, the huge regional diversity. But if you look comparatively at Indonesia, again, the comparative story is important. So what's the comparative for Indonesia on regional development? Well, you'd look at maybe China or you'd look at Brazil or look at India or look at Nigeria. And the paper, the important paper by, um, you know, the guy from the World Bank, uh, Global Inequality, um, um, uh, uh, Milanovic. Milanovic's paper on comparing inter subnational inequality in five big countries. Uh, Indonesia came out looking pretty good in terms of, you know, d it didn't, hasn't had the big increase in inequality that, for example, China has had. Antara, Kawasan, Timur, and Kawasan, Barat, Mizania. So, so the, the regional story at, at the big picture level is, 
is uh, pretty good. I guess the, perhaps the biggest challenge, my impression is the biggest challenge may, well, quite a lot of challenges, inevitably, because Indonesia, Negara, Kapuloanya, and Turbasadi Dunia, so inevitably Arabanyak Tantangan. So perhaps the biggest regional <coughs> challenge, I guess, maybe is, maybe is Papua? Question mark. Again, I want your comments on it. Is, but Papua, in some ways, Papua is, I think of Papua as being partly, it's a, it's like an economy, Pacific Salatan, yeah? And so the comparative for Papua, maybe Bukan Jawa, Tatapi Mizania, Papua New Guinea. And actually Papua, Papua, Propinci Papua, Papua Barat, Papua Barat, Maju Lebi Chupat, Daripada, Negara, and Negri, Papua New Guinea, Mizania. So they're trying to think about some of the regional challenges. Uh, some, of, some of the other regional challenges, I think everybody here knows them well. So again, I just want your comments. Um, I think one of the big challenges is the large vertical fiscal imbalance that is between government, uh, central government allocations and regional government. And so you get this big vertical fiscal imbalance. Therefore, no incentive for Pemorinto Daera untuk tapat pendapatan sendiri. So you can sort of, that tension between Pus Pemorinto Pusat Pemorinto Daera is still, I think, a big unresolved issue. Uh, also, can the central government incentivize local governments to improve their performance? I'd like to get feedback on that question. Uh, I think still there are incentives uh, for Pamekaran, or maybe not as big as before, but still quite big incentives, I think. And the bigger question is, is, is fed fiscal federalism working? So the theory of fiscal federalism says that mobile resources, that is, Yaitu Modal, then then Tanaga Kerja, Akan Pinda ke Daira di Mana about governance quality levy by. So is that happening in Indonesia? Because that's, well, that's the principle behind fiscal federalism. I'm not sure it's happening. So that's another question. Untuk Bapak Lali, please. Can you give me the answer later? So that's, that, that's, that's the sort of regional story. Okay, so this section, and this is drawing very heavily on, on Smeru. Uh, in fact, in the last month, I've been writing another paper just on Indonesian living standards. So I've been reading everything from Smeru. And it's very impressive uh, to Masuk Liao and lots of other people here. So I hesitate to say anything about living standards, Dita Pan, Peserta, Peserta, Dari Smeru. Um, but so general story, and again, I, I want your comments, is uh, general story is sort of pretty well known. Um, that is... Um, very rapid poverty decline. Um, um, yeah. In fact, I think this is from you, I think, Asif. Dumi <laughs> Um So this is the general, this is the BPS story of, of, of poverty falling, um, uh, uh, falling quickly earlier than later, partly because growth has been slower, as I showed earlier, and also because the growth poverty elasticity is probably lower n now than it was in the earlier period. And that's, of course, related to the rising Gini ratio, especially this decade, uh, this century. So um, that's the sort of, that's, that's my argument. And again, I, I want comments, please. Um, so the major issue maybe is not the Kamiskinan, but the near poor. Um, you know, and this is because Again, as uh, Asep and others have shown, you get a lot of movement, the Atas and Dibawa, but Garis Kamiskinan. And so, um, especially the, the, the vulnerable and the near poor dealing with catastrophes. Maybe, again, question mark, maybe the poverty trap. So, at early stages of economic development, poverty falls quite quickly when you've got growth, but then at a certain point, uh, growth. Uh, Growth is not enough, and especially when you need targeted um, targeted policies for the poor, and that's partly what uh, Asia presented at our conference in Singapore in March. Yeah, the sort of targeting and so on for for the poor. Uh, question of which poverty line should be used. Um, question of data quality. I don't know. Apaka other staff DC staff dari BPS, so we're relying on BPS data, which I think is pretty good comparatively, um, but maybe it's missing the top and the bottom. This is, I guess, the argument that it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to estimate expenditure patterns for the top and the bottom. 
And then the question is, how effective is the targeting? So that's what uh, Parsley presented a paper in Singapore in March, and other people have written about it. So that's the poverty story. Um, the inequality story, this is where I need your guidance. I, I, I have hypotheses for why inequality has risen so sharply in this century, but uh, of course it's not easy to calculate, partly because the standard measures of inequality are not uh, additively decomposable. That is, if you use the Gini, you can't decompose. You've got to use the, some other indicators that aren't as useful in other respects. So some debate about the about the uh, what's happened to inequality. Uh, the the widely cited paper by uh, actually now my my local member of parliament, Professor Andrew Lee, Dulu Dia Guru Besar ANU Sekarang Menjadi Anggota DPR, my local member of parliament. Andrew Lee and Pierre van der Ring, uh, they use this top incomes approach and they find there's a bigger increase in inequality than using the Gini. Also a paper in the BIS a couple of years ago by those scholars from Belanda, yeah, on measuring inequality. So um, so it's increased, but how much has it increased and why? And these are my hypotheses for, or at least questions, why has inequality increased? I think part of the story is labour market. It's the end of labour intensive growth and labour market segmentation. Uh, it's Maybe it's the second commodity boom. Although the first commodity boom was uh, didn't lead to much increase in inequality. In fact, an, another one of my korban at ANU is working on this uh, Donny Pasaribu comparing the two commodity booms. Uh, so the, maybe question mark not clear. Uh, maybe it's a global story of rising high end incomes, especially in the services sector. You know, financial services happening everywhere. Uh, maybe it's decentralisation, autonomy diera, but not really clear. As I showed earlier, it's not it's not obvious that regional inequality has increased. Uh, there's not much tax progressivity in the system. So this is um, some work which another one of my korban was involved with. That's some of you may know Matthew Waypoi uh, from the World Bank. And so this is showing, I guess, what we'd expect, which is that Indonesian inequality starts off Pre, pre pre tax and transfer starts off lower than Mizania, Brazil, Mexico, but the other countries do more to redistribute uh, does Indonesia. So Indonesia's system isn't all that progressive. So is that part of the story? Uh, or is there a kind of story, to, is there an industrial organisation kind of enterprise story that the barriers to SME development um, maybe a, a, a still a problem. That is, it's hard to start businesses. Although from our discussion on Saturday, Mukti, it's not that hard, right? <laughs> I heard some case studies of Mukti can tell us later. <laughs> but there's a question. There's a question: Is is Indonesia, especially after the Krismon, is the banking sector not so easy to be able to facilitate SME startups? That kind of issue. Question mark. I don't have the answer. These are just hypotheses. So again, I'd like your comments. Okay. So education and health. So this is from this is from Daniel. Where's Daniel? Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Thanks. So this is your work, Daniel. Which uh, uh, again, Daniel presented a great paper in a conference in Singapore called "A White Elephant." Right? What was it called again? Ed education in Indonesia. A white elephant? Question mark. Is that right? A great paper, thank you. Um, and also the book which Daniel edited, uh, the update book with Gavin Jones and several other papers. So this, this, is, uh, um, this is from my reading of Daniel and other people. Clearly impressive quantitative improvements, uh, near universal literacy, years of schooling, so on. Gender gaps utter, but tabitida talalu barati baninkan negara Islam line, if you're using that as a comparator. So, um, and maybe the funding issue is no longer a constraint because you have to spend 20% of your budget on education. But then these are some of the challenges um, from listening, listening to Daniel and other people. And Daniel, please tell me if I'm missing something. <laughs> um, so there's the quality indicators in Indonesia clearly lagging on these TIMS and PISA, these, uh, these standard indicators. Um, education outcomes highly correlated 
with socioeconomic status. Again, that's, that's what we know from his work. Higher education sector um, still still lagging quite a bit, and maybe education labour market mismatch. So the story of you know lots of high school and diploma and even degree graduates coming out, but that not fitting in with the requirements of the labour market. Uh, so th that's that's the story I think. But again, I want your comments and a somewhat similar story for health indicators. That is. Big quantitative improvements, but still some quite serious problems, and including, of course, stunting. Um, so this is the same set of indicators as I showed you earlier, but this is now 55 years later. So you see Indonesia, the catch-up is incredible. From Remember, years of schooling before was 1.1, now it's 7.3. Life expectancy, Nike. Tuapulu, Lebi Town, so big improvements. So that's that's obviously the big story. And the question now is, as Indonesia, Kaloitu, Masuk, Kelompok, upper middle income countries, uh, the policy maybe has to change to adjust to that. Uh, and then labour market story. So this is this is uh, based on a lot of the work of my my um, enemy. Chris Manning, you know why? You know why he's an enemy. I think Mukti knows why he's an enemy, because we're the size and colour, the lapang and tennis. So he's my enemy, my tennis enemy, my very close friend. <laughs> so Chris has done a lot of work on, on the labour market, I guess, and and of course Wawan, that's that's your field now. I think you're becoming the Chris Manning abaduapulusatu, right, on on labour market. So we're relying on you, Wawan, to tell us what's happening, please. And so the big story, I think, is clearly one of um, the um, the much slower structural change in the labour market, and probably increasing dualism in the labour market because of the change in the regulatory regime, especially minimum wages and uh, severance pay. Again, which you've written on that as well, Parasip. Uh, so I think that story is is an important story. Um, so, of course, with democracy, you get freedom of association, which is a good thing, but uh, the labour market outcomes don't seem to have been as good, especially if looking at formal sector employment growth, uh, which seems to have been pretty weak most of the time since 2000. Uh, okay, almost finished. Ten minutes. Chukup, Chumikasi. Uh, so uh, in, uh, another one is environment. So here I'm relying on my my boss at ANU, uh, Pat Budi Reso Sudamo. Budi and others done a lot of work on it. And um, Indonesia clearly a case of the so-called environmental Kuznets curve. Remember, Kuznets curve was about inequality. It said U-shaped inequality. That is inequality rises and then declines. In fact, now shown probably not correct because countries are now rising again in many cases. But the environmental Kuznets curve is a very popular concept and that is basically saying countries' environment deteriorates up to a certain point and then it begins to improve. And so although we don't have really clear data on it for Indonesia, this is again trying to get a, a sort of story on environmental indicators over the long period. Uh, by the way, just I should have mentioned earlier, one thing which I noticed trying to write this book, the updated, the Dissi Katiga, is it's quite hard to get data series uh, Janka Panjang. That is, I look at BPS and other places, and you get short-term data series, you know, maybe 10 years or 20 years. But for develop, economic development, a long-term process, you need 50 years if possible. So uh, I hope one day we can get someone can produce uh, a statistical series for leading indicators, Janka Panjang, Yaitu, Lima Pulu Town, then Levi. So it's quite hard to get them, surprisingly difficult given how good BPS is as a statistical organization. So, yes, yeah, this is a general sort of story of, of environmental indicators, pretty well, um, you know, deforestation and urban amenities, um, the estimates of green national income well upon Agakasa may mean indicative that Indonesian growth is partly uh, because of the um, use of non-renewable natural resources, but that's not the main story. That is, the main story is really growth, however you measure it. Some of the solutions uh, to environmental issues will partly, maybe if you believe the environmental Kuznets curve at some point, at some point, as you approach maybe upper middle income standards, 
environmental priorities begin to change and policy begins to change. So, Chonto Saja, as my Japanese friends remind me, Japan, Padatown, Lima Puluan, Anampuluan, Nagari, Agat Kotor, Sakarang itu salah satu Nagari yang paling bersi. Yeah? So, this is sort of the process of environmental cosmetics. Maybe it will happen in Indonesia gradually anyway. So, some of the, so these are some of the issues. Um, removing carbon subsidies, urban transport, um, need transparency, you know, the, the tragedy of the commons, especially forests and, and maritime resources. Maybe need some sort of global and regional support. Uh, was was read this, uh, the Norwegian program, was it helpful? I'm not clear to me, I'd like some advice. And so maybe as you become more and more service economy, environmental amenity will improve anyway because services tend to be less polluting. So that's the sort of story I want to tell for the environment section. But again, I'd like your advice, please. And finally, um, and in a way, it's probably the one that economists have the most difficulty with. We need advice from political scientists to try and understand the, the relationship between institutions, governance and economic development. It's really quite a difficult topic to kind of analyze. And it's partly be, because it's at the intersection of economics and politics. You need both economics and political science to give you some guidance. So do institutions rule? So Danny Roderick at Harvard says institutions rule. Uh, Jagdish Bhagwati at Columbia University said Maimangitu Sala, that institutions are an outcome of development, not, not a determinant of it. Uh, have institutions led or lagged Indonesian economic development and what difference has democracy made? So first point to make, obvious point is you need to be comparative because you, you have to understand compared to what because International capital is internationally mobile, therefore the, the, the ability to attract capital depends on how, com how attractive you are compared to other countries. That's the first point. Second point is um, how to measure institutions and governance. Uh, it's really difficult, inevitably subjective. There, there are a lot of metrics, but they're mostly opinion-based surveys, uh, inevitably subjective. So these are some of the ones which are used. Um, Transparency International uh, Corruption Perception Index, the Logistics Indicator, the World Bank Series, the Ease of Doing Business, and the World Government Indicators. The sort of story it tells for Indonesia is more or less what you'd expect. That is, Indonesia's ranking on most of these indicators is sort of about the same as its ranking on, on conventional economic indicators. So what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that institutions don't really lead Development and they don't lag development. They kind of they, they, the two the two processes work hand in hand. So it's not clear that you can make a big story out of out of uh, just looking at the aggregate indicators. And that's partly also because it's difficult to get long term series on these indicators, even though they're pretty weak anyway. It's difficult to get indicators, but most indicators suggest that Indonesian rankings are similar to what they are for economic development. Uh, with the one major difference, of course, which is on the indicator of voice and accountability, Indonesia may among maju cepat as the most democratic, uh, most democratic nation state uh, in ASEAN, and probably the most democratic nation state in the Islamic world. I'm guessing. So, it's a big improvement in voice and accountability. In a way, the challenge is there hasn't been a corresponding improvement in these various indicators of government effectiveness. So working out the link between democracy and government effectiveness is, is, a big, is a big challenge to think about. And again, I'd like your comments on this. So one way of thinking about of sort of unpacking the institutions and governance story is to provide case studies, because often the case studies are where you really kind of understand the process of policy reform. So in the in this part of the paper, I've chosen three policy, three um, three case studies just to kind of illustrate some of the dimensions of governance and institutions. So the first one is policy uh, reform, 
And, and so here, this is sort of standard political economy where you identify the relative, the relevant policy actors, the decision makers, you know, uh, legislature, executive, uh, think tanks like Smeru, business, foreign, domestic, blah, blah, blah. You work out their objectives and you work out their relative power and then you can kind of make judgments about about the outcomes of policy on the interaction between these factors. Uh, it's mediated by the power of ideas, clearly. Uh, that nice paper by the famous American economist Ann Kruger, you know, the power of ideas, ideas often win. It's mediated by bureaucratic capabilities and so on. So we sort of have a story, I think, of the Suharto era, uh, been written about by a lot of people. Uh, in a way, the, perhaps the most influential paper was the paper by the late um, Hadi Susastro from CSIS, who wrote a wonderful paper on the reforms in Indonesia in the 1980s. So the story was, um, and it's a bit related to that so-called Sudley Law, that is, the sort of very simple story is Suharto, in a sense, lacked political legitimacy and therefore his legitimacy rested on his ability to deliver rising living standards which required rapid economic growth and for that he needed the technocrats the so-called you know Wijoyo Berkeley Mafia and they were empowered when the economy was economic conditions were difficult and when economic conditions were weaker uh, were, sorry were stronger they they were less powerful and that by the way was also the PhD dissertation, the ANU dissertation of Hadi Basri, in a sense, the link between oil prices and policy reform. And so we sort of have a story of that. And then Hadi wrote it up in the 1980s. How did Indonesia, how come Indonesia reformed effectively in the 1980s? And that was Hadi's story, in a sense. It was linking this sort of analytical framework, drawing on these currents I mentioned to explain why, you know, Suharto needed growth and therefore he needed the technocrats. So this is a vastly simplified story, but I think the essence is quite powerful. Uh, so the question now is for the democratic era, uh, yay to Sajak Krismon, we don't really have such a clear, at least I don't in my mind, I don't yet have a clear analytical framework for understanding policy making. So I think that's one of the big challenges for uh, social science researchers currently to try and understand the kind of the policy framework. Um, so part of the story is you have to sort of think of different policies. So you think of macroeconomics and microeconomics. So again, Indonesia, Sabagai Lagu Lama, Indonesia is a pretty effective macro manager. That is, Bank Indonesia is credible and independent. The Ministry of Finance runs the fiscal law. So the macro story is easier to comprehend, but the micro story is much more difficult, partly because the number of policy players is now much more diffuse, which is what you expect, of course, in a democracy. So working out the kind of analytical framework is is difficult. So one, one approach is perhaps what Dede suggested in a recent paper. You have to think of a strategy of small steps, not big bang reform anymore, just small steps, incremental progress, maybe. Uh, and I mentioned before, there's no clear correlation between commodity booms and reform. That's that's the argument of in that nice paper by pa Acho Patunru and pa, uh, Shamsu Rahaja. So that's that's the kind of this is again where I need your advice. But this is the way I'm kind of thinking about it. Uh, another case study I'm looking at is the persistence of corruption. Um, so memang kontribusi dari Indonesia. Untuk istilah global adalah KKN. So that's an Indonesian, Indonesian uh, invention. <laughs> so KKN, and as a lot of people have written about, democracy and decentralization meant that KKN, democratic and decentralized. Sorry, did you? Uh, did, uh, oh, sorry. I'll, I'll shout. I know. I'll be Orang Australia and speak loudly. <laughs> so, uh, that, 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 so this, this is another question. So clearly no, there's no correlation between corruption and growth. That's a general Asian story. If you do a scatter diagram of corruption and economic growth, you don't see any clear pattern, maybe even a positive one. You know, China and India, the fastest growing economies, also rank pretty highly on corruption. It's important to develop a taxonomy to distinguish between rent-seeking and bribery. 
Remember, that was, again, the seminal contribution of Anne Kruger, the political economy of a rent-seeking society. Rent-seeking technically is not corruption. It's often quite transparent. If you, lo if you lobby for protection from government, for import protection, uh, that's not corruption, right? It, but it's rent-seeking. So thing, you, have a, you have to have a taxonomy between rent-seeking and, and corruption. So in Lee Kuan Yew's Singapore, there was no corruption. You'd end up in jail if you were corrupt. But there was rent-seeking, typically, right? It helped to be in the Lee family. I hope, I hope this streaming isn't going to Singapore. Mungkin say tita bole masuk next time. So, so rent -seeking, and you have to th distinguish between the petty and the grand. That's clearly it. They have different drivers, different explanations, and different, different implications. So then these mediating factors are relevant. The more complex the regulatory regime, uh, the more scope for corruption. Uh, openness uh, tends to limit corruption, not always, but can. Uh, civil service reform is relevant, likelihood of detection and prosecution. So these mediating factors are, re are relevant. And then what's what difference has democracy made? Well, it's made the, s the scope for civil society action greater but it's also created this, someone once said, the only thing worse than organised corruption is disorganised corruption. So sort of question, you know, putting aside moral considerations, um, question mark. So there also, that's the kind of way I'm thinking about the issue, but I'd like your advice. Uh, a final one is just working out the division between state and market. What should, what does the state have to do? I mean, at least provide directly or... Uh, orchestrate its provision. So things like legal system, police service and so on. And what things are best left to the market? So if you look at Indonesia, like almost every country in the world, in some areas you see not enough government, in some areas you see too much government. So I give some examples of where I think for Indonesia the challenges lie. Okay, five minutes. That's perfect timing because I've finished just about. Okay, oops. So that's my story. Some pace Sakaran. Summing up, so this is just a quick summary. I won't go through this, but this is still looking at the two periods. What are the continuities and what are the changes? Um, Zaman Odebarud and Era Democracy. So this is my kind of take on it. Uh, there are continuities and there are changes. The continuities, fairly rapid economic growth, but faster earlier than later. Fairly rapid structural change, but the drivers of change Sectoral drivers have changed between the two periods. Macro policy, uh, pretty prudent and stable and conservative, but the mechanisms for achieving it have changed. That is, fiscal law and central bank independence have replaced balanced budget and, um, and a subservient cent central bank. Persistence, uh, persistent ambivalence to globalization, I think that's a general story in, bo in both periods. Uh, sectoral policy, a consistently strong industry policy rhetoric, that is, you know, importance of promoting industrialization, um, but policies not all that, not all that successful, Turang, yeah, in, it's hard to do industry policy in a globalized world. Uh, I think agriculture policy has probably changed, uh, he's the expert, Pat Lally, on that, but my impression is, Pat Lally, that agriculture policy Earlier emphasised, you know, rural productivity, and now it's become much more about rents and distribution. But I'd like your comments uh, about managing natural resources. That's always been difficult. This is sort of like any natural resource-rich country. Indonesia struggles with um, the resource curse, like like Australia, like many countries. So, natural resource management has been difficult. Institutions, so of course the major institutional change is Indonesia is now one of the most vibrant democracies in the world, um, greatly increased regional autonomy, more independent legal system, but also quite a few continuities in institutional development. Uh, ownership, I haven't talked much about ownership, but ownership patterns, corporate conglomerate ownership has changed, but it's also pretty similar once you take out the Suharto family from the earlier period uh, and some new actors, but it's a fairly similar story, fairly high levels of corporate conglomerate concentration comparatively. And social indicators, so I've discussed already, 
um, pretty good social outcomes, but some challenges, especially rising inequality and um, labour market issues, employment growth and uh, education challenges. Okay, Trimakasi Banyak, Maaf Sait, Bicharat Lalu Banyak, and looking forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Hal Hill is really fascinating. And in the Slido, I noticed that there are a lot of questions and comments. It's around like 300 comments. No, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, so now I think I opened the Q&A sessions first, but during that session, you still can post your comments and questions through Slido. The hashtag is Hill Seminar. So, uh, three questions first, maybe for Asep. And um, please state your name and institution. Yes. Two? Another one? No? Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, please be critical. Okay. No. <laughs> Goodbye. Terima kasih, Pak Halil dan Nala. I think there's only one word to describe your presentation. Amazing. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> so we are looking forward to reading your third uh, edition of your book. So you do that. I have two questions. Uh, one on growth. Uh, I think everybody in Indonesia has the aspiration that we want to go back to the 7% and even higher uh, rate of growth. In a book you edited with Ehsan Khan a couple years ago from ADD. Yeah, I think the, the main uh, argument of that book says that uh, this book used the uh, growth constraint analysis and the book says that the main constraint to higher economic growth in Indonesia is uh, inadequate infrastructure and the current government do exactly what was uh, recommended in the book investing a lot on infrastructure do you think this strategy will pay off will we ever go back to the 7% and higher growth, uh, rate of growth. Yeah. Uh, my second question on inequality. If we look at your uh, graph, we see that inequality actually rises very fast after 1990. Then the Asian penal state crisis brought it down and resumed again after that. So I am currently uh, working on a paper, but a very slow progress. My main hypothesis is that the current increase in inequality was actually just a continuation of the previous trend. Therefore, to understand what actually the driver of this increase in inequality, we have to look at what happened around 1990. Uh, and I suspect that the story will be more about the story of labor market. Remember that in 1988, we had uh, major reforms, the regulacy, including uh, the Pacto, yeah, uh, uh, reforming the banking sector and everything. So I'm just curious about your thinking about this, that, that the current increase in inequality has nothing to do with, with reformacy, with decentralization, or with uh, democratization and everything. It's just a continuation of the a secular uh, trend during the order baru. Thank you. Uh, Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I show that you've asked two, in a way, probably the two biggest questions I'm struggling with, and I don't have clear answer, but let me just try and sort of have a, a, a perchoba on you, yeah? um, because they're both, I think they really are the two big questions in I'm thinking about. So on the growth story, 
the gap is quite big in per capita terms, right? Order Baru, uh, Lima percent per capita, rata rata, and now it's sort of Tiga percent. So it's a big difference if you do it per capita, which, which is the relevant measure. Um, why? Why is Indonesia not growing as fast? So, we, we, we don't know. Remember, there's a nice piece in the Majala Economist recently. Economists don't really understand growth exactly. You know, we've got growth econometrics. We've got growth decomposition analysis. We've got a lot of theories, but we can't really tell why a country grows at 7% and another country grows at 5%. So we, it's conjecture, as, as I see it. So if I look at the countries, so which countries now in Asia? So first of all, the global environment is, people think it's hostile or negative <laughs> currently, but actually a lot of countries are doing pretty well. So Chonto Saja, India, China, Vietnam, Philippines, all growing 6 to 7 plus percent. Philippines is a really interesting case because Philippines was considered always the dropout in a way, Benjamin Higgins drop out really is the Philippines from 1980 onwards or even earlier. So uh, we just finished a book on the Philippines with friends from University of the Philippines. Why is the Philippines now growing at 6.5%, almost 7%? And, you know, we have conjectures and we've got theories, but, but we haven't got a precise an pinpoint answer. And even even India, why is India growing so fast? I mean, we sort of know it's it's opened up and all that and democracy sort of works and institutions, some, some of them are okay. We don't really have a very clear answer. So we're in this sort of murky world of conjecture where we don't really know precise answers. So if I think of Indonesia, why is it not growing as fast? Uh, you know, infrastructure clearly is one of the factors. But if you do, someone did one of those cross-country regressions on growth and infrastructure, I forget who it was. And I think the main conclusion was it was really poor infrastructure really was an inconvenience, not necessarily a drag on growth. You know, the argument is as commuters in Jakarta, instead of having a half-hour commute, you have a one-and-a-half-hour commute. So it's inconvenient. Is it really causing growth to be lower? Question mark. I'm not sure. So, I mean, so my instinct would be to say yes. If you look at all the, if you have a simple model of determinants of growth, clearly one of the explanatory variables would have to be infrastructure and the quality of the infrastructure. Is it the main factor? I don't think so. It's clearly a relevant factor. It is a main factor. I don't know. And taking the Philippines example again, Philippines has pretty uh, mafia, Kalawada on Philippines any. Philippines has pretty lousy infrastructure, but its growth, the growth acceleration really began around 2010 when the infrastructure was even worse than it. I think of infrastructure as being one of these factors, you know, one of these right hand side variables, but not probably the main one. I mean, I think I kind of have a, a view that capital goes where the rate of return, this is a simple view of, you know, basic economics, capital goes where the rates of return are highest. And the rates of return depend on the profit, profitability of investment and the certainty of the investment environment. And so I think maybe the, the determining factors I think of things like, you know, government prog progressivity in the tax and transfer system. My impression is it hasn't changed much. There's a labor market story, which is different. But otherwise, yeah, it's not clear. But I, I think your point is absolutely right. It's, uh, you, you shouldn't see the inequality issue as being uh, caused by or associated with the arrival of democracy. Also, regional inequality. Not clear that regional inequalities changed much. Is, would you would you say? I mean, this is the work of Yogi and others who do this very carefully. So we know clearly that interprovincial inequality has been pretty stable all the way through. I mean, taking out the mining enclaves, we have we're less clear about if you measure interregional inequality at the Kabul Parton level, not at the provincial level. And that's partly because we don't have really consistent data, you know, because the Pemeka and all that. But question mark. I don't know. But what do you what do you think, Asim? Yeah. I, I, well, we will Talk more. discuss yeah. this again when we have done the analysis. Great. Later. Yes. Actually, that's an important point. When we've done the analysis, this banya omongkosong to masuk dari saya, banya omongkos. Everyone has their favourite theory, and you need to do the analysis. That's crucial, and that's why smeru among appendix goes.
Um, still talking about democracy, Pak. So there is a question from a participant that don't you think democracy has influenced to the Indonesia economic development? Because during the Suharto era, actually, people were controlled, but the economic growth is still high. What do you think? Oh, wow, this is a big topic, huh? the relationship between democracy and economic development, and I, uh, I don't have an answer. I mean, clearly, if you do a, plot, a, a scatter diagram, you see almost no correlation. Suli, I don't know. Hello, Suli. Oh, oh, hi. Oh, hello. Hi. Sorry. So it's a big question, another really important question, and we... We don't really have clear answers. So there's there's a nice paper recently, some of you may have seen by um, Asimoglu and others, Robinson, you know, if anyone's going to get a Nobel Prize, it's going to be Asimoglu. Um, and, and they have a nice paper, an, an NBER paper, called Democracy is Good for Growth. Highly recommended you read it. It's a very technical paper, but it, it's a really interesting paper. So they're arguing... The democracy in the end is going to be good for growth, and they have a kind of technical explanation for it. If you look at the experience of this uh, Kawasan Asia Timor, it's not clear, is it, Pat Lally? It's not clear. You know, the stars in that, remember that first table I showed you of the star economies? None of them, except for Japan, none of them were democracies, right? South Korea, in, in the high growth period, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, China, and Suharto's Indonesia. So um, I guess the conclusion is that authoritarian regimes can be, I think, can be sort of, if you like, almost bimodal. They can be very good or very bad, meaning if you get a, a strong leader, authoritarian political system, and a develop, strong development-oriented regime, you can get very rapid development. That, that's the East Asian story from the 1950s onwards in most cases. But you can also get terrible regimes if you've got authoritarian leaders. I mean, a lot of the African story is, of course, you know, terrible authoritarian regimes. So the argument, I guess, is democracy at least puts a check on excesses. But sometimes you're putting a check on, you know, the excesses which might lead to more growth. I mean, sometimes, you know, you can you can have strong governments which can implement reform very quickly. So, Toronto, Saja, Indonesia, Patatown, Lapampuluan. Remember, in 1983, Indonesia was a kind of petroleum economy. That is, energy exports, Patasati 2, Sakita, Tujupulu, Lima percent, Jumla export, yeah? And, and government revenue, Kira Kira, Dua Pratiga, Brasaldari sector Minyak. So Indonesia was in a way a petroleum economy and it could have gone the same way as the other uh, petroleum economies in the 1980s which had a lost decade, you know, Nigeria, Mexico and most of the other African countries. In that very good book by a guy called Alan Gelb, there's a very good book called by this guy Gelb on looking at the performance. Indonesia was the star exception in that period. And that was partly because, as Hadi Susastro's paper explained, this was sort of top-down reform. Uh, you know, that the, the technocrats, Pa Ali and Pat Wijoyo, tell, told Suharto, uh, pa, if you want growth again, you've got to do this, this and this, and do it quickly. So there was no, the Tidada Masala Deng and Depeyer, Tidada Veto plays, he just did it, yeah. And in fact, Hadi's point is to make in that wonderful paper by Hadi, they engaged in a strategy of what Hadi called low politics. They didn't engage in big ideological debates, you know, do we need reform, do we need liberalisation, because they probably would have lost the argument. This is Hadi's argument. And therefore, they just did it. So that's a case where authoritarian governments we can be effective, but of course we know authoritarian governments can be <laughs> destructive. So I think is that kind of answering. Yeah. So, so of course, of course, if you take individual liberty and freedom as being the most important thing, like Amartya Sen and all that, then of course you just say democracy is the most important thing. Yeah, forget forget about growth and all that. It's democracy. So if you take that as the objective then, of course, you're, you're right. But it, I'm trying to draw the connection between those political developments and economic policies and outcomes, and that's where it becomes yeah, a bit more... Like what she said, it's the next, like... Next one? Yeah. You mean... Yeah. Yanka, yeah. Yanka, yeah. Yanka, I mean, the top, the top, the top one. one. Yeah. Now the economic growth may interrupt by the freedom. 
Ah. Yeah. Like so maybe it not interrupt growth, but it may make, I guess one key lesson is it makes reform more difficult, right? Because when you're doing reform in a democracy, by definition, you have to get enough of your const constituencies uh, in favour of reform. So it means if you think of all the policy actors, you know, and got the de Air, uh, sector business, modal asing, think tanks, all that sort of stuff, you need to win the argument. Uh, and so it's a much slower and more complicated process and there are more veto players. The point about, I guess, Mizania Tant Lapanpulu and Dicini, veto players, veto players, Hampiatita Ado. So once to Ado, you went to the top. As Pat Sadley used to say, once you get to the top and you convince Bapa, it all happens quickly. Uh, is that kind of, it's a very important question. Is that, I don't know if I've answered it or not. But, okay. Yeah. Thank you, but I think uh, we move to the second question. Thank you, Bas Lamat Siang. My name is Rizky from UC Davis. I've been your long-term admirer. Oh, <laughs> Not yet your student, but my professor are all your students. Um, my question is regarding uh, labor mobility. Yeah. So I would like to ask your view on lack of labor mobility across regions and of also across sectoral Indonesia. Do you think it's one of uh, cause to uh, slower growth in Indonesia, given that now we are more modern or more service-based, meaning that uh, it needs more labor mobility in order for the agglomeration forces to work on? Uh, second question is that I was kind of surprised that you mentioned regional disparity or regional inequality is not really changing because um, coming back to Indonesia this summer, like everyone has been talking about regional disparity. So is it a false alarm from the government, for example, to be worried about this uh, across uh, um, within Indonesia inequality, across region inequality? Right. Thank you. Well, thank you. They're both very important questions. So if, just to take the second one first, yeah? Before I forget it, my, my little brain. So regional disparities, yeah, tentu saja uh, itu itu tantangan buat Indonesia. So if I look at the statistics, pendapatan per capita kabupaten yang terkaya kira kira lima lima puluh kali lebih tinggi daripada pendapatan per capita kabupaten yang termiskin. I think that's sort of the, is that right, Elan? Kira, Kira, the top to bottom? Depending on how you measure. He's the guy who knows all these things. But so a huge gap, yeah? And then untuk propensi per pendapatan per capita propensi yang paling kaya, yaitu kal timata jakarta lima belas kali libi tinggi dari pada yang termiskin, is it? That's the sort of order of magnitude, like, is that right, Elan? You, Mohan corrects you can if I've got it. Something like that. So it's really big. So I often say when I talk in Australia about Indonesia, I say Perbeda and Antara, the richest and poorest in Australia, is about two to one. That is Western Australia and Tasmania. So it's you know, a huge issue. Um, but the question, I guess, is, back to initial conditions, it hasn't changed much as far as we can measure it. It hasn't changed much for 40 years. So if we compare Indonesia with China, for example, clearly there's been a big gap, a rising gap between East and West in China, and at least Indonesia hasn't had that. And the data for India, as I read it, aren't quite as clear, but the bits of India which are really progressing quickly, the gap is rising quite quickly between them and the, the poor states in the northeast of India, for example. So the gap is large, but as I read it, not increasing. Um, so is that a... So at least that's important in a way. And part of the reason we know why in China the gap is rising is because of this thing called the hukou system, which restricts the mobility of people. So you can't get a labor market adjustment, um, you know, to, to respond to big income differences. And that links to your first question, which is labor mobility. One of the strengths of Indonesia, I guess, is the labor market regionally, is, I think, is pretty well integrated. Uh, well, one, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you know the the freedom to migrate 
in Indonesia is is pretty high. That is, people can, and we know that in the re, in the frontier regions, the commodity boom regions, migration levels are pretty high. So, and over time, transport costs have fallen, information costs have improved. So, as far as we can measure, you know, based on the census, the intercensal demographic data. Labor mobility seems to be fairly high and responsive to differences, and so we know that you know that kids come to Java for education. We know well documented story. People move from the poorer eastern Indonesia to the more developed western Indonesia. So I think labor mobility. My impression is it's it's uh, it's you know it's it's not a big challenge for Indonesia. But please. Tell me if you think I'm getting the story wrong. So the regional inequality story is a big problem, clearly, even though it hasn't increased. And uh, a lot of what I know on that comes from um, work of my colleague at ANU. Some of you may know Blaine Lewis. And Blaine Lewis, Lama Di Sini, Eddie World Bank, Jakarta, Blaine's argument is that, is that you haven't really seen the kind of service quality improvement, di daerah, settler autonomy daerah, Dari para harapan, para saat, para tahun dua ribu satu, when para waktu autonomy daya mulai. So that's perhaps the biggest challenge. And I think occasionally, saya senang ada kesempatan bertemu dengan Ibu Sri Mulyani. Dan Ibu Sri Mulyani selalu kuat ya bahwa supertiga dana pemerinta langsung ke pemerinta daya, tetapi service quality improvement. So I think that's an issue. How to make the federal Indonesia walaupun itu negara persatuan dalam praktik itu negara federal. So how to make the federal system sort of work better? I think is still unfinished agenda. And maybe it's because my impression, if I understand the autonomy daya story, is it's back to kind of kekuatir on bahwa Indonesia akan menjadi Yugoslavia, pada uh, back to Krizman, therefore Tiba Tiba Harasada Autonomy Daira. So it happened, it was not like you call a big bang decentralization, but it perhaps didn't have the planning to be able to make it into Untuk Pelaksanaan. So, yeah, I think that's a very important story. Yeah. Um, ah, now this, I want, I want to hear this guy. Kerja kau bagus betul ini. Masalahnya, Menurut saya, ini semua nggak berubah Republik ini dari mulai zaman Belanda ya, ekstraksinya itu. Jadi kalau dibilang waktu zaman Soeharto bagus, dia kelola itu korupsinya itu. Jadi pembagian itu dibagi. Jadi sing pantas misalnya. Ya. Jadi kita kan bagian dari pemerintah itu. Ya. Walaupun kita nggak ikut mencuri, tapi kita kan lihat di sebelah kita semua. Jadi ekstraksi ini hal. Dari zaman Belanda sampai sekarang tetap berjalan. Maka tadi kan kita bicarakan dia tadi bilang balkanisasi. Kenapa enggak terjadi? Karena uang dikasih ke daerah. Tapi pada siapa? Nah, kau tadi bilang ada apa demokrasi? Enggak ada. Substantif demokrasi enggak ada. Penjahat paling besar partai-partai politik. Ya kan? <laughs> kita mesti lihat nih. Kau dulu ingat nggak Howard Dick pernah nulis itu? Hmm. Howard Dick pernah nulis bahwa di tengah-tengah negara kumpo yang begitu kejam, mereka nggak peduli bunuh siapa pun. Yang tadi mula-mula waktu zaman Soeharto mungkin Mancor Olsen punya stationary bandit ya. Jadi Soeharto, oke okay, semua orang boleh ambil, semua orang boleh ambil, tapi yang bagus. Tapi dia pun, kenapa satu? Itu kan yang si Asep lihat tuh. Dari tahun 73 sampai 83, waktu kita invest ke pertanian. Jadi uang bedanya dari Meksiko dan Nigeria semua. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uang itu dipakai kan karena waktu itu kan mungkin yang muda-muda nggak tahu nih. Tiba-tiba harga beras naik. Jadi Pak Harto panggil Wijoyo. Kenapa ini naik? Wijoyo berikan alasan bahwa ini kan El Nino. El Nino kan orang nggak kena batas negara, jadi mereka nggak akan mau ekspor. Terus ditanya, kita negara Negeri aku nggak bisa kasih makan rakyat kita sendiri. Oh, diberi kenalasan oleh Perujo ya, nggak punya pupuk, nggak punya irigasi, nggak punya. Eh, pakai uang nih. Saya mau selalu sembada at all cost. Nah, jadi dulu itu kita rubah semua itu sistem. Jadi jangan pikir itu Soeharto kerjakan at all cost sembarangan. Seluruh sistem itu kita rubah. Sehingga dan yang menarik bahwa petani-petani kita 
sangat responsif. Maka itu belum pernah dulu dunia mencatat penurunan tingkat kemiskinan di pedesaan begitu laju dibandingkan manapun. Belakangan 20 tahun kemudian Vietnam berhasil menyamai kita lah. Jadi sekarang betulnya ini, ini Republik makin kacau. Jadi ada yang tanya tadi, ini akan krisis enggak? Pasti akan krisis. Yang lebih pintar dari saya ada. Saya sok pintar tapi ada yang lebih pintar dari saya. Iwan Jaya Aziz. Iwan asal kemarin kita selalu ngomong kan, selalu minum kopi. Dia udah bilang sama saya 2 tahun lalu. Lali, the country is headed to a crisis. I don't know when. But ini pasti jalan. Jadi sekarang gini. You mean crisis? Crisis. Iwan. Crisis economy atau kedua? Bisa dari ekonomi krisis bisa jadi lebih besar lagi. Jadi sekarang ini, kalau HSD lo anggap, ini republik sudah hancur nih. Karena apa? Di daerah itu. Kau bayangkan, semua bupati-bupati itu, kita kan dulu bikin otonomi daerah, maksudnya pengambilan keputusan lebih didekatkan ke rakyat. Supaya keberpihakan meningkat, dan juga kualitasnya meningkat, dia lebih mengetahui keadaan rakyat sana kan. Tapi terjadi pencurian lebih besar. Kenapa? Nah, tadi anak saya bilang, talk about itu, but don't talk about yourself. Susah. Waktu kita mau dirikan KPK, ini yang mudah perlu tahu nih ya. Mega waktu itu presiden. Mega nggak mau tanda tangan nih, panitia seleksi. Jadi datang pada saya, Mas Ahmad Santosa, dia bilang, Bang, ini kita nggak bisa nih. Dia nggak mau tanda tangan nih, Bu. Wah, seluruh demonstrasi. Si Bambang, nanti saja ke istana. Baru tertata. Jadi tidak ada presiden atau pejabat yang manapun yang mau KPK itu kuat. Enggak ada. Maka itu sebaik KPK berdiri, saya bawa Muhammadiyah NU dua-duanya, maka itu cara saya ke KPK. Kau kan ingat tuh, NU Muhammadiyah kita pakai. Ini saya kira kalau nggak bisa kita pakai uh, agama ini enggak. Tapi sekarang yang masalahnya kan di situ di agama. Jadi kembali, ya. ini ekstraksi ini berjalan terus. Bayangin, ada otonomi daerah. Tapi nggak makin meningkat keadaan dari daerah itu. Kenapa? Karena uang itu balik ke sini. Di orang kan. Lihat aja gitu. Yang intinya apa ini sekarang? Intinya ini, kalau begini terus, nggak akan bisa. Jadi, nggak ada accountability. Orang ngomong apa, hal, suka-suka hati orang ngomong. Jadi nggak ada accountability. Karena partai politik, kok bisa bayangkan, itu sistemik dari mulai penitia anggaran kan? dari mulai anggaran hmm. sudah diatur tuh kalian tahu nggak anggaran kalian mengaturnya kalau kalian mau uang kalian bagi dulu kita nanti kita kasih anggaran kalian jadi itu the heart of the republic udah begitu nah, jadi kau tulis buku kau nanti kita bicara lagi <laughs> thank you pak terima kasih terima kasih pak <laughs> so actually we have been running out of the time but Things that you are still into to the discussion, so should we continue for another like 10 minutes? Okay, um, but um, actually, Pak Dilan. Pak Dilan. Okay. Pa, pa Lali, Dilan. Yeah. Pak Lali, respond yeah. to that question. So, do you want yeah. to add something? Tida Biza Tamba, Dia Ahli. Dia Ahli. Comments are there. Yeah, another Menari, question. Menari, yeah. Thank you, Pak Lali. Erna Marie Lokolo from IPB slash Dewan Pertimbangan President. Mm -hmm. So I have to speak a little bit optimistic, mm -hmm. not in the tone of pessimistic. Lebih little optimist dari pada Pak Lali. Sure. <laughs> Even though Pak Lali yang ngirim saya ke Cornell. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the decentralization saat mm -hmm. ini sudah di moratorium. Uh, karena memang pemerintah melihat efektivitasnya uh, allow me to speak in bahasa Indonesia Pak. Silakan. You, you, uh, uh, Ibu berarti moratorium dari segi pemekaran ya. Yeah? Right. Ya. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Karena sudah dievaluated, sudah dievaluasi bahwa um, Pak Lali thank you. Ya, yeah, uh, Pak Lali terima kasih. <laughs> terima kasih banyak. Senang ketemu lagi. Um, sudah di moratorium yeah. minggu lalu baru saja Menteri Dalam Negeri 
uh, berbicara di depan kita. Jadi we know that uh, the government realize that uh, the the otonomi daerah dan desentralisasi tidak uh, begitu efektif dalam mengelola fiskal di daerah. Uh, yang kedua, uh, Pak Hall, uh, would it be nice if you stretch a little bit to the tahun sekarang and you use data yang lebih terbaru, karena di situ akan terlihat uh, economic uh, digital mempunyai peranan penting mm -hmm. dan juga generasi muda uh, mempunyai peranan penting. Um, kebetulan saya juga ketua ketua studinya ya Pak Asep. Mungkin nanti bisa kita share ya Pak ya tentang uh, ekonomi digital uh, terhadap pertumbuhan ekonomi Indonesia. Tentunya ini masih very short. Uh, the policy baru dikeluarkan tahun 2017-2018. Tetapi saya kira ini akan menjadi uh, main driver mm -hmm. untuk economic development selanjutnya. Dan saya optimis mm -hmm. bahwa Indonesia akan menjadi negara yang lebih maju lagi karena empat dari delapan unicorn di dunia ada di Indonesia. Tokopedia, Bukalapak, mm -hmm. uh, Gojek, dan Gojek, yep. Traveloka. Yep. Dan if you analyze the economic, ekonomi kreatif dan ekonomi digital dalam pertumbuhan ekonomi Indonesia akan terlihat sekali uh, dampak positifnya. Even though ada juga dampak negatifnya, karena ini masuk ke dalam uh, apa namanya program program membangun dari pinggiran. Uh, demikian juga Bumdes Bumdes dan Pok Darwis Pok Darwis yang salah satu penelitiannya dilakukan oleh Smeru uh, uh, pada saat mempresentasikan desa-desa uh, wisata. So I think I I'm gonna my point is to to bring a little bit tone of optimistic uh, on Indonesian economic yeah, development. Good. Thank you. Ya, yeah, uh, terima kasih. Uh, saya saya sebetulnya setuju sekali dengan ibu, karena saya juga masuk kelompok optimis. <laughs> Biasanya, my friends say saya terlalu optimis. <laughs> actually, so uh, memang setuju dengan ibu. Uh, tentang digital economy, ya, yeah, um, beberapa bulan lalu kami ada seminar di ANU oleh ibu Mari, Mari Pangestu. Dia sedang menulis paper yang sangat menarik tentang Yeah, pengaruh digital economy. Then dia juga optimis bahwa apa uh, Indonesia memang seorang Indonesia cepat adopsi ya yeah, teknologi baru. So I think that's a positive development. So the question is, apakah ada dampak makroekonomik? Yaitu apakah kita bisa lihat dampak secara makro? Tentu saja banyak pengaruh mikro, that is firm Gojek dan Tokopedia dan lain-lain. Is it big enough to have a macro story? Rupanya sampai sekarang belum. Kalau dilihat dari laju pertumbuhan ekonomi, not yet an impact. Now, uh, ada kemungkinan barangkali apa, uh, dari national accounts, barangkali itu apa, underestimated. Ya, itu karena banyak sektor jasa-jasa di mana perhitungan uh, uh, jumlah produksi agak, agak lema. Oleh karena susah mengukur kegiatan-kegiatan uh, digital, ya. Yeah? So it's possible maybe where it's being underestimated oleh karena itu mungkin laju pertumbuhan lebih tinggi daripada yang resmi oleh karena this undercounting di sektor-sektor jasa. So, yeah, I think it's a positive story. It's a young, it also has big policy implications misalnya untuk sektor pendidikan bahwa, bahwa murid-murid harus siap untuk zaman digital and I guess if you read the the penalty and dari Pat Daniel uh, the bottom maybe I don't know Daniel bottom 40 percent mungkin belum siap untuk zaman zaman di digital so that's a big question about education also a big question of tentang sector uh, perbankan is the is the financial sector apakah itu juga siap untuk perusahaan perusahaan mikro yang masuk zaman uh, digital so yeah i agree with you i'm, I'm an optimist as well okay i'm afraid we don't have um time anymore so i think it's the last question still related about the industry is still possible to apply in fund industry policy which successfully brought japan korea and taiwan to where they are today oh yang pertama yeah yeah 
So, um, where's Hario? Hario Masiera? Hario, can you answer that question, please? <laughs> Young Pertama, you, you know much more about it. Please. Young Pertama, is it still possible to do infant industry Young Sapodi Japan career? Can you please answer? Dietal Jalabi Banyak Dari Saya. I think the world has changed. I mean, in the past, it is possible to do infant industrialization, provided that Korea, remember Korea and Taiwan, etc., they have a very insulated bureaucrat yeah. and, and disciplined by performance criteria. That's, right. That's different with Indonesia. We almost impossible to put performance criteria and uh, have a bureaucrat that is insulated from politics. Uh, Apalagi sekarang, ya. Yeah. Then, uh, and the second, like, we are left behind. The world has changed. Uh, the model is now global production network. In global production network, it is impossible to have a complete, uh, complete production from hulu to hilir. So, it, artinya, ya, sudah tidak bisa lagi dalam situasi dunia yang uh, model, model, model produksinya sudah berubah dan mungkin Mukti bisa menjawab juga lebih tepat tentang Mukti, <laughs> Mukti mau tambah? Silakan. Thank you, Mas Aryo. Put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think it's uh, Mas Aryo's uh, comment is uh, correct that words have changed. Hmm. So like the infant, no, it's like in the global production network value chain. So we need to also change the perception of import. Because I think even the government still have the negative sentiment about import. But as we know, the manufacturing in Indonesia, especially the one engine to accelerate the growth, because now the growth 5% is most uh, more because of the commodity. Like the manufact manufacturing sector, actually, it's quite hidup uh, enggan mati tak mau lah. So it's like it's still there, but not really contribute to the growth. So one thing to uh, accelerate our growth is actually to revitalize the manufacturing sector mm -hmm. and most of the manufacturing input is actually imported so we need to also uh, change our perception that import is always bad because our manufacturing actually uh, heavily in uh, import content mm -hmm. so I think that's also uh, something that we need to work on an in Indonesian economy that uh, import is not always bad yeah. because if we want to uh, tap into the global production network of value chain it will uh, automatically, our import will increase, but then our export will also increase. Yeah. Uh, and one also one thing that uh, makes our current account is uh, not that good that our uh, our import of our uh, manufacturing is for domestic market, which is we not gain the dollar uh, dollar that we use for import. But if our uh, manufacturing is for export oriented, mm. so we can can get another foreign exchange that. To compensate our import uh, yeah. expense. Yeah. Uh, terima kasih banyak, uh, Mukti dan Hario. Uh, Bukti ini bahwa korban saya tahu jauh lebih banyak daripada saya. <laughs> so thank you very much. Actually, Hario, I think we wrote a, a paper with Dede called Industry Auto Bay Bay Yang Sudah Tua. Yeah. So. I, I, Something like that. And then you, you remember Kasim, Kasimbal Andari Dissertasi Dede, the ANU, ANU dissertation, governments are not very good at picking winners, but losers are good at picking governments. So I think... Uh, that's right, how not to industrialize. The, yeah. So in a way, managing... So who was the question? Where did who, Siapa Tanya? Who, I forget who asked. Oh, over here. Yeah. So that's doing doing industry policy in a globalized world is the big challenge, isn't it? So we know you've got to have policies. You've got to have the missing markets and the you know the standards and the kind of certification and the infrastructure back to infrastructure and the skills. Can you pick winners at firm level? Don't think so. Can you pick industry level? Even that, I don't think so. And that's Mukti's story in a way. The global production networks, you can't pick a particular winner because it's globally coordinated production. Yeah. Nice closing. Yeah. Um, Frederick List. Frederick List. Maybe it's just a nickname. That's a nom de plume for somebody. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, thank you so much, Pak Hal. So I think we have a special gift from Smeru. Ooh. I invite Pak Asep to come forward and give this gift. And I become your fans club for <laughs> Okay. <laughs> So, alert everyone, on behalf of Smeru, I would like to thank you for your fully attention and active participation for today's seminar. I believe now we have a complete story about the Indonesia development economics for the last uh, half century. So, about the questions, so whether that, uh, jamanku, so whether it's true or not, so answer it. And, uh, okay, so we have a lunch box there. Uh, once again, I'm Nila Warda, and thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.